Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and verse 16. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find it on page 250. Now, when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people and plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people, Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. What a strange text for Advent. In Advent, we wait for the coming of Christ in a manger at Bethlehem and in our own hearts every day and in glory at a second coming. And here we have this strange and wonderful text about David wanting to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord is none too happy about it. I kind of like it. It seems like this time of year there is a lot of pressure to have perfect responses to God in our gospel reading this morning, Mary hardly even seems afraid when she's visited by the angel Gabriel and told that she's going to bear the Son of God. The author of Luke tells us she is perplexed, but ultimately she responds to God. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. So obedient, so consensual, so perfect. It's like she doesn't even consider the consequences of saying yes. We often confuse Mary's perfect response with what our own responses should be, thinking that God only wants us to say yes. Yes, to the perfect family gathering. Yes, to all of the perfect presence under the tree, regardless of what it might do to our spirits or our bank accounts. And then we have our passage from Romans, which is a doxology. Doxology literally means word of glory. And it reminds us that the incarnation is a joyous occasion. And it's good 
because the incarnation should evoke within us a response of praise. But the problem is we often think we can only give praise to God in certain ways. Only when we say yes. Only when we feel or make ourselves feel joy. Today's reading in the Old Testament reminds us that sometimes giving praise means saying no. For many, Advent and Christmas are a difficult time. Some are dealing with what feels like unbearable losses. Facing holidays and celebrations alone or without loved ones or with difficult loved ones is hard. So hearing a word from the church that no matter what is going on in our lives, that we should give glory and praise to God right now in a certain way that only allows us to acknowledge joy because the date on the calendar says that we should feels a little oppressive. Who knew that even glory and praise and joy could feel oppressive, but they can and they do. And that's the beauty of our passage from 2 Samuel this morning. David is feeling joyous. He has conquered. He has danced. He has built things. And he has prospered. He sets out to praise God by building a house. David confuses what God wants with what he wants. He feels as though God is on his side and he can do nothing wrong. The sky is the limit. Anything is possible with God, right? So why not? Why not build God a house so God can know the same luxuries and have the same security that David has come to know? Wouldn't God want that? And Nathan, the prophet, agrees with him. At least at first, the king, the king chosen by God, and the prophet, the one chosen to speak God's words, have both misjudged God's mind. How does that happen? I mean, aren't their intentions good? Wouldn't God be honored by having a house, a house made of cedar? I mean, these aren't just any old people. This is David. This is Nathan. God knows them. They are people of God, chosen for their professions by God. They know the stories of their people Israel better than anyone else. They are well steeped in the knowledge of God's activity in their own lives and among the history of their people. They have experienced God's own protection. They are people of faith. So how could they get this so wrong? As we have been learning throughout Advent, we learn once again this morning God does not submit to our expectations, no matter who we are, king, prophet, political party currently in power, church. God's honor is not justified by, nor does it depend upon any of us. God doesn't waste any time here letting Nathan and David know just that. We are told that the same night that David proclaims his plan to honor God with a house, the word of the Lord comes to Nathan saying, oh no, you won't. And whatever gave you the idea that I wanted a house in the first place? 
Eugene C. Bay, president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, that is a mouthful, writes, the king and the prophet discover that they are in the presence of one who confounds human expectations and surprises even the faithful. And then he corrects himself. Surprises especially the faithful who presume to know how God is acting because it is the way God must act. If Advent teaches us anything, it is to expect the unexpected. God comes as a baby, not as a powerful king, not as a wordy prophet, not as an ordained priest or a wealthy politician. God comes as a baby, conceived by an unwed mother. God comes and grows up in a backwater town, the son of a carpenter. God spends his life with outcasts and sinners, welcoming all those who are unwelcomed, doing the unexpected almost every day. Each year, we read at Advent the Magnificat, we read that God scatters the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, brings down the powerful from their thrones, lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty. We read this every year. God does unexpected things. And yet here we all sit, most of us, expecting something else. Expecting the perfect holiday. Expecting something that makes us very comfortable. Expecting something that already agrees with the ways that we live our lives. Expecting something perfect. The faithful must not be afraid to ask ourselves what surprises we are missing by God's presence with us because we are waiting with only a certain kind of expectation. Because we only want God to come in certain ways. Because we are waiting and thinking, like David and Nathan, that we know how this story goes. We know exactly what God wants. See, we can read this Old Testament passage in 2 Samuel with our blinders of faith on and see only God's promise to make of David a house, a promise filled in a surprising way with the birth of Jesus who is linked to David through Joseph's lineage. And all of that is true. But if that's all we get from this story, then we have missed so many of God's unexpected surprises. We miss that God refuses to be contained by our limited understanding. We miss that from the beginning, God was with the people. God has lived among the people. God has tented with us, always been vulnerable, moving where we move, being blown by the same winds, experiencing the same elements. We miss that God doesn't always want the same things we want. God isn't interested in security or structures or protection or perfection. God is interested in people, in salvation, in peace. Nathan is instructed to go to David and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? 
I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. God's agency belongs to God alone. God makes clear that God has lived where God has wanted to live and that God did just fine before David was ever born. God brought the people up from Egypt. The people did not bring God. And God moved. God did what God wanted to do, and God will continue doing what God wants to do. God refuses to be confined, refuses to be owned or possessed or manipulated, even by the king that God chose. God reminds David who is in control. Hint, it's not David. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people, Israel. Remember, remember from whence you came. God reminds David and Nathan and us that God is God and we are not. Christmas is almost here and the faithful are expecting a savior. And in our reading on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we are reminded that this holy day that we await is about celebrating that God takes on the flesh and tents among us. We're not waiting to place baby Jesus in a manger and welcome God into our world once again. We are not waiting to light the Christ candle and proclaim that God's light has finally arrived because we lit it. We are not waiting so that we can build a savior of our own making. We're waiting to see what unexpected thing God does next. Amen.